Hello and welcome, everybody. It is September 19th, 2023. We're here at the Active Inference Institute in Guest Stream 58.1. And today, the session will be around the experiences of those who have worked with Gerald Edelman. Edelman lived from 1929 to 2014. And as hopefully this conversation can explore and unpack a little bit, worked in various areas related to the brain, body, and mind. So without further ado, I will have our guests introduce themselves, give a little bit of a background on how they came to be working with Professor Edelman. And then we have several prepared questions and several other questions. So thank you all for joining and perhaps Andrew, if you'd like to begin. All right, so uh, I'll just start with a little bit with my background. I did my PhD at University of Minnesota. Um, and then I did my postdoc at Hopkins with Apostles George Opolis and Vernon Mottcastle. Uh, and then I got a job in Phoenix working in a small uh, neuroscience institute or neuroscience department in, uh, at a hospital. And uh, I worked there for six or seven years. Uh, and my interest was working with uh, non-human primates with monkeys and studying how they uh, reached for different objects and drew objects um, and then looked at uh, activity in primary motor cortex, neurons, uh, and we carried out uh, different kinds of analysis based on the directionality of the neurons in motor cortex, built populations, and were able to actually look at these neural signals and see how they corresponded in a pretty exact way to the way the animal's arm moved um, in time and space, in other words, trajectories. And um, after working there six or seven years, I was invited to come and look at this new institute that Gerald Edelman was establishing in San Diego in La Jolla um, and uh, met a bunch of super interesting people like Giulio Tononi and Olaf Sporns. And uh, really their deep intellect and curiosity and creativity has convinced me to move to San Diego. Um, and uh, so I uh, ended up moving there. And so Edelman uh, was able to build this gorgeous research facility uh, on the Torrey Pines uh, cliffs, basically. And uh, it was a magnificent uh, architecture. And he recruited a, a number of people uh, besides uh, uh, Sporns and Tononi. Uh, and so he divided uh, the group into theorists and experimentalists. And I was an experimentalist. But we would have lunch every day together as a group and, and uh, discuss different topics. And, and I was really exposed to a whole new way of thinking about neuroscience in terms of sort of the cognitive aspects of it, which I still have difficulty with, to tell you personally, because I don't e even know how you define cognition. And I'm not sure that anybody really can, or as Vernon Mockcastle would say, I don't know the answer to that, nor does anybody else. Um, maybe Carl would uh, take issue with that. Um, but anyway, it, the, the coolest thing about it was being really exposed to a lot of creative thinking and deep intellectual endeavors. And um, I've really never regretted the seven or eight years I spent there. I, th I think it really helped changed the way my career went um, from being sort of a motor control, strict, sort of, uh, you know, very careful scientist to using my imagination a lot more than I would have otherwise. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Cheng Ming? Um, okay, yeah, I can uh, speak about uh, uh, my my uh, journey with Dr. Edelman. So I was originally uh, from Taiwan. I graduated with a medical degree in Taiwan University uh, in 78, but I was very interested in doing basic science. 
So I applied the PhD program and I got into Rockefeller University. And uh, that um, you know, started to search for a laboratory. And uh, uh, certainly, uh, Dr. Edelman, you know, with, uh, you know, he's a uh, uh, very uh, powerful intellectual uh, capacity building uh, uh, on the in the building, you know, it was on the ninth floor of the Bronx Laboratory. I was very impressed, so I I joined the, the laboratory. Um, so um, since seventy eight to eighty three, I was a PhD student, uh, um, that, um, and I was working on the topic called uh, called neural cell adhesion molecule. So at that time, Edelman already got his Nobel Prize for immunoglobulin, but he would be, you know, usually, you know in usually elegant way, would say, I solved the molecular recognition. So he said, I don't want to be stay in immunology to collect more awards. He said, I will work out the cell recognition. So in his mind, the, the cell, how cell recognition work is through uh, a group of adhesion molecular interaction. Uh, so that, um, that's how he started to work on the cell adhesion molecular. And the Duty's house uh, actually work out the chicken cell adhesion molecule. So when I joined the laboratory, my PhD things was uh, work out uh, um, um, the first uh, mammalian cell adhesion molecule. And uh, in addition to NCAM, though, I supposed to work out on these uh, um, adhesion molecule mediating the neural cell recognition. Uh, as he said, he would say, you know, I asked him, oh, so after all, what would be my PhD thesis? And he would say, Ming, you know, when I start to write a poem, I don't know how it's going to end. You know, that's the way he, he would put his language there. So he said, just figure out a retinal tactile projection. You know, so that, uh, you know, I'm a hardworking student, so I would work out on that. And as you know, these days, our so-called uh, systems biology approach, right, is these transcriptome single cell RNA sequencing to identify a non-biased way to identify molecules involved. At that time, the so-called systems biology approach was uh, making monoclonal antibodies. So I would be there taking out the brain, you know, and the retina and the tectum, tectum and uh, produce, I produce 18 batch of the, of the monoclonal antibody against these, uh, these neuronal cell membranes. So I certainly have identified a lot of adhesion molecules, but um, um, none of them really show a very distinct pattern. I mean, these days, I think we, I mean, the field the using the transcription factors was able to identify some patterns. But at that day, though, it's kind of all, all together. Uh, but um, um, I, I remember that actually, no. I, so anyway, is that enough? I didn't really figure out retinal tactile projection, but that's enough for me to, to graduate. Um, but uh, um, um, at that time, though, I also still remember, you know, how I actually, I mean, still he has a great impact on my uh, professional career. So I was cutting chicken spinal cord, you know, cross section to mapping these cell adhesion molecules. <laughs> so I have some feather, chicken feather hanging outside of there. And uh, they stand with this end came with the most beautiful exquisite pattern. You know, I mean, brain, I later work on the feather as my major research model, kind of as a Rosetta song to understand the language of morphogenesis. But there, I remember how I started, is that you have this feather, they form these branches. So these branches are actually originally formed cells, then they die to become space. But before they die, they actually light up with the end came right up with NCAM with the most exquisite pattern there. Uh, so you kind of say, okay, you're going to carve out this region. You light up with NCAM, you light up with the sonic, and then other signal come in to say you die. But before they die, they light up that pattern. So the feather pattern is very exquisite. Radial symmetry, bilateral symmetry, bilateral asymmetry. So Adam was very impressed by those, uh, you know, no, those findings. And, uh, um, so that, um, you know, that uh, I appreciate he actually encouraged that. He, he, when he sees something he appreciates, he, he, he go, he, he encouraged it. He didn't say, oh, you're supposed to work on the brain or whatever. He actually liked it. And uh, subsequently, he also 
you know, develop this idea of topo biology, which he would acknowledge to say it's sort of based on the very exquisite pattern we found in the, in the feather. Uh, but of course, he developed it further. Uh, but some other time he would say, if this is not in feather, I'm going to, I am Edelman, I'm going to get another Nobel Prize. So I, I like it that he encouraged that direction. So let, later, though, when I became independent, I sort of uh, say, okay, you know, um, a brain is wonderful, but it's, it's all like being curved inside. I don't figure it out. But uh, I'm not that smart, but I might be able to figure out the feather pattern formation. Uh, so I have a reasonable, successful career, uh, figure out, you know, the able table of the feather. Uh, but, but as I said, not just the feather itself, but use feather as a, as a, as a Rosetta stone to figure out the morphogenesis. And, uh, uh that, um, uh, sort of, uh, I think uh, I appreciate that, uh, uh he's encouraging on that. And, uh, and also, you know, as you know, the same cell biology comes along. And the feather in a bird, you know, baby chicken is one way, adult chicken, male, female, all looks differently. But they are all from the same group of the same cell. Let my lab have demonstrated. So it is the so-called stem cell niche would be modulated by sex hormone, by age, by season, uh, by temperature. And then they help you produce different uh, feather forms to, to let, uh, to adapt to the environment. So, so I, I think I, I enjoy my research career and it was obviously, uh, have his impact. And I think he's intellectually uh, brilliant and always encouraged going after, after fundamental principles, saying that if you're going to work on a question, ask the most profound questions and approach with the most uh, available technology, current technology of the day, you know, don't waste your time. On, on small questions. And, and I think I have to take those in. So I can say up to here and we can discuss more later. Thank you. Awesome. Carl? Hi, so my name is Carl Friston. And like my two colleagues, I found my stay with Jerry Edelman both foundational and very, very formative. Um, I was quite early in my research career when I joined the Neuroscience Institute. Um, Having trained as a psychiatrist, I got into brain imaging. And at the inception of brain imaging, people were for the first time discovering principles of functional brain organization, such as the principle of functional segregation, and subsequently principles of integration, how segregated, um, specialized parts of the brain communicate or are coordinated or are integrated together. And one of the key theoreticians and neuroanatomists that um, authored this particular interpretation and deployment of neuroimaging was Semi Zeki. And Semi Zeki, uh, for those of you who don't know, he's, he's still very active, uh, uh, one of the architects of the of neuroaesthetics um, um, in his late retirement now. Uh, but he was friendly with Jerry Edelman and Semi was um, famed for um, understanding the computational anatomy of early visual cortex and visual cortical hierarchies and the um and i repeat the principles of functional specialization and integration um so after a couple of years um at the inception of human brain mapping using positron emission tomography and establishing um this um for example, the color center in the in a particular part of the, uh, the visual cortex i was e effectively sent to New York. Um, so my period of um, engagement was a, um, a fellowship between about 1990 and 1992-93. So this slightly predates Andy. Um, and it covered the um, translocation of the Neurosciences Institute from the Rockefeller University to um, uh, La Jolla um, and uh, the uh, under the auspices of, of the script. So I spent you know, half uh, my fellowship at the Rockefeller and then subsequently uh, watched the building of the magnificent Neuroscientist Institute on North Torrey Pines Road that Andy referred to with the auditorium, if I remember, designed by imported um, experts in audition and music and sound engineering from Sweden. Uh, it, it was a really an amazing place. I, I do remember a couple of lunches um, before I returned to the UK to uh, pursue my career in imaging neuroscience 
um, under the auspices of the Wellcome Trust, um, but uh, only a couple because we were sort of um, in rented accommodation from the scripts on the other side of the road. Uh, but it was a, an awe inspiring uh, bit of architecture, both intellectually and um, practically, in terms of uh, the, the, you know the early days of the Neuroscience Institute. Um, so. I was sent there basically uh, because um, uh, Semizeki thought it would be good for me to go and work with Jerry Edelman. Um, retrospectively, I now appreciate that I was um, sent there to replace a gentleman called Reed Montague, um, who had been tasked with on the pure theory side, as opposed to the cell adhesion molecule and the, the wet lab um, um, side of uh, Edelman's research, um, on the pure theory side. Um, at the point of my arrival and to a certain extent at the point of Reed's um, brief uh, exposure um, to the Neurosciences Institute, the theory of neural group selection was becoming consolidated. And in particular, what drove the selection of neuronal groups, neural ensembles, cell assemblies, however you want to describe them. Um, and given um, um, Edelman's um, penchant for incredibly incisive in um and um straightforward but very creative biological thinking he thought well it's obviously some kind of natural selection um and therefore there must be the homologue of adaptive fitness that is underwriting the scaffolding and the dynamic um uh, structuring of connectivity or connections that um, were definitive definitive of in the spirit of functional specialization and segregation, but also the mediator of functional integration um, of these uh, neural cell um, neuronal groups. So this um, this became known generically as value. Um, so Reed was working on value dependent learning, the plasticity and the principles that underwrite which synaptic connections have the right kind of adaptive fitness in their milieu in that context. That enabled them to persist and other uh, connections went away and became um, um or contributed to the you know the sparse coupling of of neural networks um, and then read um and we can talk about the you know the glorious stories about the 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 departure of reed um reed actually ended up uh, um in a, in a rather circuitous way with uh, terry sanoski at the sulk um subsequently then hooked up with people like peter diane and wolfram um schultz uh who at that time was in zurich and of course this the you know the story that emerged from that was re the reward prediction error story um that um actually ironically uh reed did not but a number of uh, wolfram um eventually got the brain prize for some decade or so later but the inception of that story was actually at the rockefeller um and it was um basically um a an attempt by i think reed to formalize the pr the principles are that must be in play to make the theory of neural group um selection under what were important what was an important um dynamic from uh, edelman's point of view which is this notion of re-entrant dynamics so very very early on um he had um identified the the fundamental importance of of recurrent connectivity and re-entry as very formative in um the, you know, the the emergence of these structured groups and the um associated functional specialization um i just open brackets just to point out that you know you could um you could claim that certainly his early conversations with with um um the people at that time sort of preempted stuff in computational neuroscience that we now take as sort of uh, for granted not really realizing where it came from but certainly his work with vernon mancas i'm sure andy will be able to speak to this uh, later on on you know the importance of re-entry and dynamics and oscillations in the formation of these groups and sort of cortical columns and the like that, that was a sort of i think um you know the, the the monographs that they not the monographs but the the the, the papers and uh, the articles they wrote at that time i think were quite visionary um stephen grossberg was also hanging around a few years earlier 
And I think you could probably claim that between the two of them, they invented computational neuroscience, certainly a la, you know, New York, Boston, sort of, uh, you know, the, the East Coast kind of um, uh, um, style of, uh, of computational neuroscience, closely involved with something called the Neuroscience Research Foundation. So that they, the, as I understand it, and again, Andy may want to correct me here, but this was like the, um, the forerunner of the Society for Neuroscience. It was a group of people people, um, uh, perhaps Max Cowan is, is, is a name that comes to mind, people who actually invented words like neuroscience, uh, which wasn't a thing, certainly when I was applying to to, you know, to, to, to my undergraduate studies, um, uh, and trying to create institutions, academic institutions that would endorse this notion of neuroscience. And the Neuroscience Research Foundation was like the old guard. And then the Young Turks came along and reacted against the um, the old guard, the Neuroscience Research Foundation, to form the Society for Neuroscience, and then we all know the story uh, since that time. It's now one of the, the biggest societies in uh, in academia. Um, so, it, it just making the point that Edelman and um, you know his colleagues and vicarious colleagues, uh, you know, a lot of people, Oliver Sacks being being one, Ernst Mayer being another of his favourite sort of. Um, um, characters to talk to all of whom would come and visit and we were privileged just to listen in and conversations in, in this very formative time where some of the sort of i think conceptual pillars of the way that we understand you know, you know neuroscience uh um uh, you know in the 21st century were um you know were first um articulated probably not using quite the same words that that we use nowadays so no one talks about re-entry anymore uh, it's all about recurrent neural networks or sort of um uh, feed forward and feedback and the like uh, but the same underlying dynamics and maths i think is absolutely there anyway i was brought in to replace reed montague um so that was my little contribution um whilst we were in the rockefeller um the, 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 I made the mistake of um, thinking that the right way to do this was to actually write down equations and try and sort of naturalize it in terms of in terms of mathematics. Edelman was a great biological thinker. He was not a very good mathematical thinker. Um, so there was a bit of a clash there. So I, I remember one uh, one meeting um, very early on when it was being decided what I was going to be doing. Um, um, perhaps it's useful just to say the context in, you know, in which those those early meetings took place. So Andy has already mentioned Giulio Tononi and Olaf Spawns. They were two key uh, people, uh, Edelman's young men who already who were already in in situ, um, and then I replaced Reed. Um, and they were working really purely on theory, um, and that theory was tested in the context of uh, what was. Uh, um, an, uh, a forerunner of supercomputing, a hypercube that was driving in my day little robots. So again, you know, Edelman was doing neurorobotics in the nineteen you know nineteen eighties um, in exactly the same way that people now in developmental neuro neurobotics are, are are still addressing exactly the same questions, um, and probably with with, with um, the same kind of uh, computer infrastructure, but obviously upgraded. Um, so. Um, we were sitting around, and Edelman was uh, called out to take a, a, a phone call from from Germany. Um, and there was a look of horror on people's faces because I'd suggested a relationship between value dependent learning and the Riscola Wagner rule uh, uh, from behavioural psychology. Um, and as soon as I you mention an equation or a formula. That set Edelman off, and I didn't know that, so I didn't know I pushed the wrong button. So when Edelman came back in, I was effectively rusticated. I was prevented from doing any work um, for three months, and for every day, afternoon and morning, I had to sit in the Rockefeller Library and read purely biological great texts. Um, and I ended up having to, the last one was The Growth of Biological Thought by Ernst Mayer. I had to read from by, from page to page. And when I did so, I had become sufficiently sanitized to be allowed back into the workplace to actually <laughs> to do, do some work. Anyway, um, so that, that, that was our contribution. Uh, and then when we moved to, um, you know, the whole... Um, parade of 16 wheeler trucks is translocating all the kit and all, all the um all, all the paperwork to um to la jolla and then relocating out there 
settling down. Um, I brought that work to closure. And the, interesting, that was at the point when Julio, well, Olaf, I remember him saying, you know, what he wants is basically um, to understand the and simulate um, the uh, the brain um, in a way that uh, is um, draws explanatory power from the architecture of the connectivity. It basically, would say he wants to be he wants to establish connectomics um, uh, as as a discipline. And of course, you know, ten years later, he's Mister Con Connectomics. Uh, Julio at that point was. Um, inventing integra um, integrated information theory um, with a particular focus on um, information theoretic formulations of complexity and what special, if you like, counterintuitive behaviors do you get from these biologically configured connectors when you put dynamics on structure and trying to quantify that in a way that ultimately um, transpired to be measures like phi in IIT. Um, so that, that was a fun time uh, as the mathematician the uh, closet mathematician because I wasn't allowed to, to to say anything about the maths at the time. Uh, I enjoyed that bit and sort of looking, um, you know, um, being in uh, at the if you like um, ground zero at the inception of all these the, all these aspirations, which, which eventually led to very fruitful careers. And then I went back um, to um, uh, to the UK. Just had fond memories and uh, non fond memories, <laughs> uh, but both of, of a nostalgic sort since that time. Awesome, great tales. Changming or Andrew, anything you want to add, or I can go to one of the questions? Well, uh, just to uh, expound a little bit on what Carl was saying, I don't know if you can here, <laughs> see this book. Okay, so this was. Uh, something that came out of the neuroscience research program that was sort of the uh, old boys club that Francis Schmidt um, started uh, at MIT and later was the basis for the Neurosciences Institute. And what this was was sort of the who's who in neuroscience. So again, if you look at this book, it says edited by Francis O. Schmidt. So he was the guy that started that. And, uh, so this persisted uh, even to the uh, throughout the 2000s. Um, and uh, so once or twice a year uh, at the Neurosciences Institute, they would organize one of these meetings and it would be a who's who of neuroscience. So all the Nobel laureates in neuroscience, all the big names would come for a four or five day meeting uh, and talk about their research. And as a member of the Neurosciences Institute, I got to sit in and meet these people. And it was uh, phenomenal, especially for, with my background, because I was sort of a, not on the, the mainstream of neuroscience at that point. And uh, that was uh, really fascinating. So you got to meet people like Will Schultz and, and all the, the big names um, that were there, Francis Crick, um, you know, and uh, but what I want to go back to is this original book by Edelman and Mockcastle called The Mindful Brain. This is sort of like one of the uh, Bibles of early creative thinking about brain function. And it presages the idea that of distributed systems. This was sort of the thing that Vernon Mockcastle was very much into. Um, and so the to this day, the way most people think about brain function is uh, boxes uh, where each part of the brain is confined to a box. And then there are arrows pointed to other boxes. And so we get this idea that there's a, a circuitry. So you will often hear neuroscientists talk about circuits. And that kind of comes from the idea that you have these boxes and you have arrows and you have plus and minus signs with the arrows. And then somehow the pluses and minuses add up and tell you what's going to happen at the next box. Um, and that is um, nice because you can kind of simplify things and talk about causality in, in very concrete terms. And it's great if you're an engineer because you can write transfer functions about defining how you can output from an input. But that's not the way the brain works. And, you know, I, I think Kyle can attest to the early days of uh, MRI 
uh, studies where everybody was doing pseudo colored um, uh, representations of these different areas to see which area would light up in, in a particular task as if each area had a specific job and could be assigned to a specific task. And so neuroscience in general is still suffering from that point of view. And it's only become a little bit more clear as computational science has matured in the last five or 10 years, especially with the you know, ad adaptation of artificial neural networks to the mainstream, that you know th we can start to explore more biological, meaningful ways of brain function. And um, you know, Vernon Mockcastle recognized that um, you know, as a sort of the, uh, I would say, the founder of systems neuroscience, uh, modern systems neuroscience. Um, and Edelman talked about that um, a little bit. You know, there's group theory and some of the things that Olaf has started, um, you know, with uh, graph theory, still sort of based on strict anatomical connectivity. And, you know, if you read like Olaf's latest uh, review, where the field is starting to progress away from that constraint of anatomical connectivity, uh, we're starting to get more toward the idea of truly distributed systems. And to me, that that's super exciting. But you can look back to this book, you know, from the 70s um, and see that the seed was planted way back then and see how you know, almost 50 years later now, it's finally starting to evolve into something that's becoming more mainstream. And if you sort of look at the evolution of neuroscience, I think if you project ahead to the next 10 or 20 years, this is going to be really the fundamental change in the way we think about neural function. And uh, I'm super excited about that. And you look and you sort of back in history to see how that's evolved. And uh, I don't know, I, I think there's uh, something very attractive about thinking about things that way. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, I'll add something. I think talking about the, you know, Edelman's uh, so-called, so, so the, the brilliance about, you know, seeing things through. I, I, I don't know, in the neurobiology field, you people still sort of think the neural Darwinism idea is still there, right? Yeah. So that was the time when I was uh, with him in Rockefeller University. Uh, he would talk things like that, you know, uh, Darwinism for evolution species, and he he saw that in immunoglobulin uh, uh, coronal selection. So he applied to the to this neural Darwinism idea. Uh, but I have to say, you know, subsequently, I actually my career is mainly in university. Southern California and uh, working on this morphogenesis pattern for tissue pattern formation. And in our field, you know, sort of a more bench work, you know, aspect of Edelman, you know, this direction, not the neurobiology direction. But um, uh, in the field, uh, there were people originally more talking about the stem cells are predetermined and then they go this lineage, they go this lineage. But we using the skin as a model, actually, you know, I start to write these things, kind of a Darwinism within the skin. I mean, basically, is that there is no preset forever stem cells. If you wipe out these stem cells, other cells are waiting there to take over the space. So there is, even during development and during regeneration, to make the tissue patterning process robust, there is a small so-called Darwinism uh, competition going on in there. And that is sort of also influencing my our 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 work in morphogenesis these days, and uh, I think that's kind of uh, the impact of of him, him on on this aspect uh, as well. Yeah. Wow. All right. I'll read a question. This was from Dave Douglas. Dave wrote. We know that Professor Edelman used deep analogies in exploring new subjects as in his leveraging his knowledge of immunology and organismal development to probe conceptualization and learning. Did he ever work specifically on metaphor and analogy as such? For example, did he leverage his experience of music and poetry 
to dig out scientific facts while separating fertile from sterile analogies. An answer or just what that makes you think of? It makes me think of something which Edelman used to call me, which I am an intellectual thug. So I'm sure that there is there's a great answer to that excellent question. And it does speak to Edelman's skills and interests as a violinist. Um, I do remember that BBC Horizon came to um, do a profile on him and his ideas. And it was uh, prefaced with, uh, I think, shots of, of him pl pl playing the violin, you know, to concert standard. Uh, but I have absolutely no idea whether he used those that that, that sort of part of his life to uh, um, to um, take things beyond metaphor. So, as an intellectual thug, um, I'm going to hand over to, to my two colleagues to see whether they can give a more elegant answer. Or, or anything in that area of the arts. And an, you brought up poetry, anything in the arts and sciences. Well, I actually, I mean, I'm no, no brain biologist, but just to say that from my side of the interaction, you know, I mean, he really tried to, to merge uh, science and art. Uh, he would think, uh, you know, uh, a, a real science would be beautiful. And uh, I, and that's the way I think when I learn, as I mentioned, you know, uh, when I say, oh, I, I was expecting a more clear cut uh, thesis idea, but he would say, you know, Ming, it's like writing a poetry. He said, uh, when I start, I don't know where it's going to end. Uh, you know, it's like some artists, uh, when you ask them, uh, how do you create this painting? I, I try to ask this question to some of my friends who are artists, and they say, they say they do not, they do not have a clear blueprint of how that painting what it looks like. They have an idea, it's kind of floating in the sky and they try to grab it down. So they paint on the way and then they try to, to make it into a painting. Or I have a friend who are poet. I ask them this, they say I, they grab the world to make them coming down. And I kind of feel Adam I sort of treat the, the scientific idea, idea like that, you know, that's the, you know, this is my superficial, you know, <laughs> interaction. I, yeah. Uh, yeah, just some experience. So I don't have a direct reply to that, but, I, you know, in general, um, I think there's the uh, idea of creativity that, that he brought to the forefront. And then also, you know, with that creativity, there you have to have a certain amount of courage to move out of the sort of mainstream, right? So if you have an idea and you have to have a certain amount of courage to put that forward, uh, that, if that idea is creative and out of the ordinary. And I think artists and sort of uh, really great scientists have that in common. Maybe to that, nexus of creativity and career development and courage for you or just in the environment how did his mentoring help bring out these threads in people for better and for worse i, I think carl could attest to that i i have a hard time viewing edelman as a as a feel-good mentor <laughs> i think uh he would throw ideas out there. He could be pretty aggressive and uh, I would say frightening to uh, young people. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, cast Edelman's behavior as sort of the typical mentor. Um, but uh, again, I think the environment that he created was someplace that was uh, really special and reflected that kind of courageous creativity um and, and i really appreciate that now yeah just to endorse that that notion of courageous creativity 
Um, I think it's a really nice observation. I, I've often reflected on whether, um, let's take, for example, um, Julio and Olaf, and in, I think you could probably apply it to, to me and Andy and a number of other people uh, as well. But if we just take take uh, Julio and Olaf, who've both become world leaders, thought leaders in their own particular field, having brought something new to the table, um, and in some in some instances in you know more than one area. So Julio Tononi in terms of um, sleep research and synaptic homeostasis. Um, in terms of his um, work in consciousness studies, in integrated information theory, um, Olaf in terms of structure and function uh, and co connectomics. I mean, is the is it that Edelman had a good eye for bright young men, or is it that bright young men learned how to do this? That this was the way to be courageous. And to a certain extent, adversarial in that courage to be creative and to pursue what you have created um, in a slightly adversarial or at least sort of defensive way. I, 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 I'm not. I, I don't know. But what I do know is um, there was certainly a culture that was um, established that would allow those kinds of um skills to be developed and you know and is uh, refer to them slightly obliquely I mean, it was uh you know it was a dark culture it was uh and it has to be said it was a very homophilic culture there were no women allowed in this culture so the you know in my time the um the culture was really one man and adoring young men um and you had to um repeatedly affirm that adoration and part of that was um really useful and really enjoyable um and has already mentioned the uh the lunches that exactly the same regime um you know characterized my stay there was a, a you know a rigorous routine where all the young men would go off to the new york cafe would have onion rings and and, and burgers uh and Edelman would wax lyrical and um, perhaps this is not art and creativity but he, he was um he was artistic in his joke telling so he'd always have a new joke every every lunchtime in a new york uh diner uh, and that was a routine and it was just pure theater day after day after day incredible energy but it was theater the young men were the audience um and we basically um i think were um dancing to you know his orchestration he was the conductor and he was the director if that culture if that it's possible that that culture did did actually instill in all of us and particularly olaf and julio um the notion that to make it to make a difference and to be true to one's convictions you really have to sort of fight for and be autonomously pursue what you want to do and it is it's interesting that the the style in which both julia and olaf have pursued their their scientific ideology and ideas and creativity is very much is, is it's slightly lonesome you know the, the, um with the exception of uh, julia's work um in um in the molecular biology of sleep um the theoretical contributions are very sort of you know associated with them personally and to, to, to a certain extent with me and um you know what one could argue is um then you know the um the mathematical version of value dependent learning which would um, be the free energy principle all of these things have the same flavor as neural Darwinism, or as some people used to call it, neural neural Edel, Edelmanism, um, and so I, I often ask that question: Was it was this the skill of Edelman in choosing people who are going to make a difference, or did he basically provide a culture in which it gave people the the tools or the um, the motivation or the confidence that you can make a difference because you saw you saw him make a difference? I don't know. Um, yeah, you know, I think both of you actually, you know, said something. I I share the experience. Definitely, he set up a, a right environment. Uh, but just like when we do stem cell, stem cell and its niche, you need the interaction, you need the conversation between epithelia and the mesenchyma cells. Or in the brain, I heard it's more like interaction between neuronal cells and the glial cells. 
So a successful interaction would, would lead whatever the process to move forward. And uh, but not every process would be would be would be successful. So as as I said, I also you know like the way Carl mentioned about Edelman is the is the is the is the conductor. He actually said that in our lab meeting at the time. He said, "I you know Edelman, I'm the conductor. You know, I you know you guys. You know, it's my my symphony prayers, and uh, and you 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 pray together. You can make a, a good music." And uh, um, but it's also true. Uh, not every interaction works because uh, I was with him for almost eight years or so. Uh, not every person works. Let's put it that way. That is a fact. Uh, so some work, some don't. Right. So I think uh, people are given that opportunity, and uh, as Andrew said, it's a good outstanding environment. So so you pick up the the the, the idea from Edelman. You develop yourself. And uh, some of them, you know, or what you can call, call it Edelman lab, lab <laughs> Edelman is a then we, we, we success in a certain way or not. Um, uh, but I think it's a, it's an exciting environment. Uh, I would put it, uh, put it that way. It's, uh, it's both, you know, he inspires you. He, he gives you a sort of, of a, a exciting environment to evolve, but not everyone is cho he can choose everyone to be successful no it's not like that uh, but he did give you that opportunity to 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 be successful and uh, to to pick up something and he also give you that courage to do it as i mentioned you know people would normally think you know using the feather as a model is kind of very very high risk but uh, but he's he has that encouragement and i i do that and i i feel i really using uh feather as a, as a rosetta song i have uh, Learn something for the morphogenesis, uh, pat pattern formation field. Yeah. So I, I appreciate him for that. Yeah. Intro, or I can ask another question. Uh, I really don't have anything to add right now. <laughs> Thank you, though. It's really amazing. It's, it's such a different world and the environment of learning and of carrying out science is so different. So personally, I really appreciate just even a window into settings that are elsewhere and in a different time. So thank you for all of this. All right, I'll ask another question from Dave. Professor Edelman was reputed to be skeptical about the risk of abusing mathematical or computer models in creating theories of neural functioning, cognition, and consciousness. Some reviewers went so far as to mock him in print for using computers as research tools. But he worked with Tanini on the foundations of integrated information theory, an extremely math-heavy theory that's sometimes explained using computing imagery. Did Edelman change his attitude towards the role of math or of computing paradigms in thinking about the mind? Or did he simply start trusting his colleagues to think computationally without falling into rabbit holes dug by von Neumann and Turing? Or how did you see the role of math and computers in Edelman's thinking and research develop over a period where they were also undergoing such rapid developments more broadly? So I, I'm pretty sure that Edelman respected mathematics and computational approaches to neuroscience. Uh, he certainly, there, there certainly were a lot of theory fellows that were computationally savvy uh, while I was at the Institute. Um, and uh, so, so for instance, uh, Carl mentioned these uh, robots that were used to sort of explore and learn and sort of the beginning, uh, I guess, of embodied cognition, Carl, you would say, yep. um, where they explore the environment and learn. And then from that learning, they, they build internal models. So that is, uh, I would say, and that was Olaf's Ballywick. Um, I would say that that was highly computational um, and certainly a major thrust in Edelman's emphasis and what he wanted to do at the Institute. Uh, and there were a number of other things. Um, I think the integrated um, 
uh, part that uh, Julio did. I think that was almost all Julio's work uh, along with some of the other computational fellows. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think Edelman wanted to be part of that, but that really, I think, was mostly Julio's. And uh, I, I think, you know, as part of the culture, uh, Edelman managed to get his name on Julio's paper. We used to laugh about that quite a bit. Um, but, you know, again, I, I would say that was 99% Julio's work. Yeah, I, I, I can concur because I was there <laughs> when the work was actually done. There, there was a um, there was a sort of um, period, I can't remember, there, there was some hypothesis that pertained to a core, a dynamical core, as um, um, sort of a prescience, uh, unnecessary for some kind of, of consciousness. And I think Edelman was comfortable with this sort of intuitive notion of a dynamic core. But when you when it became articulated in terms of information theory, he um, started, I, he would, I think, um, even if he didn't say so out loud, he would have responded as he responded to me with, oh, you've got mathematosis. So uh, uh, this, is, this is another of his <laughs> sort of, um, um, ways of dealing with people who had a tendency to over mathematicalize and over simplify as a physicist would you know they're, they're reducing a horse to a point and then writing down differential equations he was very allergic to that he, uh, you know he didn't like that and, and would call that um an instance of mathematosis i think that's very distinct though from what andy was just talking about which is the commitment to physically realized embodied computation um and uh, you know, I, I think it's a really well observed point that you know that this was embodied cognition um, circa 1980, 1990. So he was quite visionary in um, I think sort of put, testing out ideas in in physical in realized systems. Uh, you couldn't just hand wave with maths. You had to show it worked. This idea worked in a real um, in a real setting. And at that time, there were. Um, and you know, um, you know the Darwin series, uh, and you know to the extent that um, you know I, for example, had to spend six months learning to parallelize C um, in order to program the robot. So, so you know, it wasn't he was frightened of new technology or computer science. I think he didn't like trivializing things. Um, it, you know, a la physicist with with, with mathematics, but it, you, you would certainly. Um, um be fully committed to the notion that you that the computation is at the heart of the kind of dynamics that the, you know, he wanted to understand that and and underwrote theory and indeed i think that you know the theory of neural group selection um speaks that he wanted to see it realized uh real you know realized in in, in a robot so um, but yeah, I think Andy's absolutely right. At the point when uh, Julio sort of just basically um, went straight from the axioms to consciousness and phi with equations, I, I think that was the time that Julio had to um, had to leave the family, basically, um, and 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 Julie did so. Um, but I extrapolated that a, a little bit more. I think you know when I read. Edelman's books and, and some of his papers, I don't understand his words, okay? And, and, you know, his phrases and his descriptions, you know, a lot of things don't make sense. If he had written those out or someone had written those out as equations, okay, what, you know, that's the nice thing about equations. Once you see the equation, you know, you don't have to worry about the words so much. Uh, you know, things become pretty clear. And I think, you know, Looking back, if he'd been able to do that, I think his ideas, first of all, would have been crystallized in his own mind better. And second of all, would have been able to be, others would have understood them more clearly. And uh, I think that's really important. If you have, for me, okay, maybe with an engineering background or something, you know, if you have a model, or if you have an idea, if you can write that out explicitly with an equation, it, it really clarifies things, it crystallizes things. And that was the thing that I liked about Julio's work, because again, this word of consciousness, you know, it's like nobody knows what that really means. But at least Julio had 
a form of equations, right? Where he was talking about information theory and in the way, you know, you could have uh, uh, a cluster uh, where information was internal versus the external information and say that, okay, if you have to have consciousness, here it is. And you could describe that with a concrete equation. I mean, that's a step forward. And, and again, I always say as a someone that, that records neurons in the brain all the time, if I wanted to find consciousness, how would I know it if I found it, right? I, I mean, if I had an equation, maybe I could do it. But you know, just the way it's defined right now, I mean, who knows? I could have already discovered it. I wouldn't know. Um, so uh, I, I think that's uh, an interesting point anyway. I, I can't resist just following up on that because um, especially evident for me in the remembered present, this, this notion that his words don't actually make any sense. I think that's pure, pure poetry and pure brilliance because what I tend to find myself doing is writing, reading the meaning into his ambiguous sentences and finding all sorts of um, meanings, which wouldn't have occurred to me otherwise. I think that's part of his art. I suspect that he would have been terrified if somebody had actually come along and tried to time down to a clear, formal, naturalized mathematical formalism, because he wouldn't have had that sort of biotic expressiveness and ambiguity that, that of course is at the heart of uh, of his evolutionary thinking. But I think it's it, you know it's it's great that you and you are able to say you don't understand what he wrote because I, I look at some of his sentences and what on earth is he trying to say here? And of course, but the exercise of trying to make sense of Edelman itself brings to the table uh, some really interesting um, sort of associations and ideas. I, I'm wondering whether that was part of the secret of his success is that he resisted the temptation to be crystal clear and just left that mystical, magical ambiguity hanging in the air for people like you and me to, to worry about and try to resolve. I, I suppose he's given that privilege after winning a Nobel Prize. I, I, I think uh, some of us mere mortals wouldn't be afforded that uh, luxury. <laughs> All right, I'll read a few more questions. We can have a few more things. So, small questions. Um, in the book Topobiology, Cheng Ming, did you draw the feathers or is that your work? The feather is my work, yeah. It's based on my work, yeah. Awesome. Um, well, how do we take things forward in science and in our work here in this level of the fractal with this amazing story and history with Edelman, but how do we take our historical and our mentoring context? Like, how do you carry that forward? Is it something you think about? I personally do, and I congratulate myself every day on not being like Edelman when it comes to mentoring. <laughs> how so? I'm not going to answer the how so question, but you can read between the lines. Uh, whether that's the right thing to do or not, I don't know. I don't think I don't think you could be Edelman now. Um, you know, in the 21st century, uh, with we are. Um, you know, we'd be too close to all the culture wars, I think, to, to even entertain that style anymore. Um, and I suspect that's quite a good thing. Although, you know, pressure makes diamonds. Um, and as Andy says, it was an exciting, well, both my colleagues have said, it's an exciting, informative time. It was a pressured time. It was a dark time for me, um, you know, in terms of the you know, the, the, the dynamics, the, the systemic, uh, the, the, the personal interactions. Um, but because it was pressured, it made diamonds. Um, and so we may be throwing away the opportunity to make academic diamonds and be truly creative in terms of making things that endure like diamonds by not having that style of mentorship. But I don't think it would be even legal nowadays, to be quite honest, to run a lab like Edelman ran. <laughs> So again, I mean, I, I think um, 
that over the years, neuroscience, I don't know about the rest of science, but it's almost become sort of industrialized. So th there's a method, you know, you as a young person, um, you when, when you finally get your own job, you have to set out and the, if you're at a university environment, there's certain boxes you have to check off, you have to get a grant, you know, you have to get a certain number of papers, you have to get something in science or nature in order to get promoted. You know, there's there's these steps. And I think young people are so focused on moving through those steps at the point in their career where they're going to be the most creative and their minds are the most flexible and they can be the most productive. And, you know, I, I see that as as a shame, actually, that that they're not given this opportunity to be uh, a little freer. In, in the way they accomplish things. And then, you know, when they do accomplish a modicum of success, they rely on their past behavior. So instead of saying, okay, I had to go through that in order to get tenure. Now that I have tenure, I'm free and I can do something that I really want to do. That really doesn't happen because people get stuck in a rut. And uh, I see that as really holding back uh, progress in, in neuroscience. And that was kind of the cool thing about the Neuroscience Institute. For better or worse, we weren't allowed to go out and get our own grants. We had to rely on internal funds. But as a result, the only person we had to convince was Edelman in order to get funded. And uh, to a certain extent, that allowed us to do things that were really creative. Um, in hindsight, I think that was a mistake because financially that was a uh, doom for the Institute. Uh, there could have been a hybrid approach that would have been more productive. And But then again, uh, as Carl was saying, the, uh, the investigators would have had to have more freedom to do that. And that was not exactly in the culture. Although I think I was an outlier because I maintained a, a separate lab. Uh, so I, I was somewhat inoculated from that. And that made it a lot more pleasant for me. Um, but... Uh, Again, I see that, that, you know, in current neuroscience, it would be nice if people were willing to take more chances um, and be a little more creative instead of uh, hoeing to the uh, status quo. Um, that would be, uh, I think, uh, uh, what we need in order to move forward. Yeah. Um, it, um, um, no, I, I think that the, in terms of the mentorship huh, that uh, you know Carl was talking about, I mean certainly I I have seen people you know do do very well, but uh, but I also have the opportunity you know sort of when I moved to Southern California University Southern California to uh, have some interaction with the Dr. Seymour Benzer, and uh, some of you probably know him. I mean you would see actually he is also very successful, but. Uh, but uh, he, he, when he came out, he would always have, have his students surround, <laughs> surrounding him, you know, very, very kindly. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, Edmund, um, is brilliant, uh, but it's kind of the sun, uh, is too bright. Uh, sometimes, <laughs> people have to be distilled into the, as you say, academic diamond. That's, uh, that's, that's interesting. So we also have seen some people, you know, didn't get along with him, uh, well. Uh, but still, I think there are uh, many, uh, many impact here. He certainly have encouraged many people go different directions. And, uh, um, in terms of the academic, uh, the, 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 the academic uh, future, right? I mean, I think you two are more uh, talking about the neurobiology side. Uh, but on the, on the morphogenesis side, though, I, I would also say he always emphasized the patterns, you know, thinking that, um, you know, pattern is kind of the way, uh, nature, you know, either biology, non-biology, they leave some, some clue for us to figure out. Uh, and when I was there, I remember every time he talked about the, the, the visual columns, uh, toss and whistle, they have worked out. He got very excited. And in fact, I have, uh, one of my, uh, peer at that time was working on, on the visual columns, uh, of the cat. Uh, but I think that paper, that work never really, go out uh, to be published. 
But anyway, on a more practical thing, I work on the uh, tissue tissue patterns, and I I, I feel that uh, you know go you know you, you mentioned about the topo biology, and uh, I again I think uh, he coined the term, and I think uh, the term I mean I think it means a lot because I kind of uh, you know eventually my career was trying to figure out uh, these uh, signaling molecules uh, because at that time people only talk about the uh, Signaling molecule very very important, but but the idea of topo biology is that uh, you even position these simply by positioning these signaling centers in a different topology, you can actually have a lot of consequence. Um, so so from there, uh, the and the, the signaling center can also have a different lifetime, the strength and the duration. And the, the 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 range they can influence. So by money by by modulating, you know, he like these terms too. Modulating uh, these signaling center, you can create a, a lot of regional differences. And up to now, as I say, from my own take, you know, bird that you look at it, flight feather here, downy feather here, you know, the beautiful crown feather here, tail feather. But these are all from the same genome. So it actually is through the positioning of these uh, different uh, um, signaling center in in a different way, and you you basically have the same same ingredient, but you can play with them by topologically, temporal, spe temporal, and especially arrange them and uh, to to create a, a quite complex uh, uh, pattern. So so I I feel that uh, in the tissue patterning morphogenesis side, you know, I I feel. That uh, you know his vision is is great, and I I think we still uh, try to work out more about how these uh, patterns are positioned. Uh, but I think that's sort of the direction in a more visualized proper biology aspect we can appreciate. Awesome. Well, perhaps if each of you would like to give any closing thoughts. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I, I'll, I'll just start. I mean, just to, to echo your know, those last sentiments. Um, I think everything that Edelman said or tried to say, um, depending whether you could understand him, I think he's absolutely right. And we are slowly discovering the truths. We just heard about topology and the importance of patterns. And of course, if you speak to somebody like Mike Levin. He'd be talking about exactly the same thing. He'd use words like basal cognition and you know pattern formation. But he, I think that we're talking about the same uh, the same principles of biological self organization. Um, you know, and Edelman, I, I didn't know about topo biology, um, but I do know you know that there are other fundamental ideas that he just you know incidental to, to him. I am absolutely sure. I think notions of degeneracy in the neurosciences and psychology. Um, you know, the notion of many to one structure function mappings, for example, these are fundamental ideas which now are taken almost for granted um, in, in, in my world. But you, know, you sort of forget how much he actually contributed um, or at least laid the seeds for and sometimes very explicitly. So it should be acknowledged, although he was, as Mark Rakel uh, put it in his typically gentlemanly fashion, Edelman was a very complicated man. Uh, he was also very brilliant and is responsible, I think, for a lot of the direction of travel and the intellectual growth, certainly of my intellectual growth, but I would say also many aspects of, of, of our academic communities. Thank you, Carl. Perhaps Andrew? Oh, wait, unmute, and then please continue. Yeah. So I, I would say, you know, uh, if there's anyone listening out there, th there's something to be said about maybe looking back at, in the ancient literature that goes back quite a bit and maybe seeing how some of these things came about and trying to put it together um, and see that, you know, there's this iteration that constantly takes place. People rediscover the same thing that's been discovered multiple times. Um, and you know, try to see how there is a, a status quo in the way 
science works. And then there's these outliers where there's sort of creative bubbles that that come to fore. And I think uh, it's interesting to think of Edelman and the things he did and the people that were associated with him in terms of sort of these disruptive, right? They call it disruptions. Um, and uh, how those disruptions may have consequence many years later. It, it's, it's kind of interesting if you take the long view. Um, so I, I think it's um, maybe worthwhile thinking about this once in a while and uh, for young people out there to be encouraged to think off, to think out of the normal way of doing things once in a while. Try to foster your creativity and have the courage to to go after some of those ideas. I, I think that's a, a take home message for me, anyway. Yeah, but I, I would say I always uh, like you know all sort of you know influenced by his idea, saying that uh, we should study the important question that have a general meaning. So I, I think that kind of idea, she said, that look at the big pictures. I remember when I was there, he talked like that, big pictures. So that is where, when he thinking about the Darwinism, he would say, it's not only for the, the species evolution, for the, for the immunoglobulin clonal selection, he would push it to, to the brain theory. And, uh, and for me, I work on the morphogenesis. I actually would come to realize that is also what happened at the tissue level. These cells are competing with each other to form that pattern. And then pattern is selected when there is a functional uh, advantage, it will be stabilized. So, so I think the idea of saying, if we're going to do science, we do, we ask big questions, ask for the generalization. I, I appreciate that. And certainly he is like, uh, how you want to call it, right? A huge elephant. So we all touch him. Uh, through different side and uh, have a different uh, take on on that, and and in terms of the young scientist, I also remember he likes the Chinese proverb. I I cited to him. Uh, that is to say, if you want to, to get a tiger's son, uh, you must get into tiger's cave. <laughs> so 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 we treat it. <laughs> Thank you all. That's a great note. Really appreciate this conversation. And again, thanks until next time. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Bye. 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 Yeah. Nice meeting you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.